Welcome back everybody to Getting Past the Premium. We have a great episode today where we're bringing on a, a thought leader in the risk management industry and that is Larry Linney, President and CEO of Insight Performance Group. Uh, Larry's been an, a consultant and advisor to our firm for a long time and helped us make the transition from a, a product-based model to more of that advisory service uh, for our clients. So we're really excited to bring you Larry's insight into the industry and enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Getting Past the Premium Podcast. All right, Larry, how you doing? You know, after a, a flight and uh, a couple of uh, long nights after Father's Day, I'm doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, uh, yeah, we're really looking forward to having you in and grateful that you made the, the short jump from Colorado to Nebraska. So, Well, I like being here. You guys have been one of the, the most amazing stories to watch your transformation over the last seven to eight years since I first met you. And I, I remember the very first time I talked to Andy, I think the it, it didn't take him more than about two minutes of conversation to say, uh, Larry we really want your help as an advisor, as a consultant, but you just need to understand, don't change us because <laughs> we're not going to do anything different because we're, you know, we, we want to stay the same. We want our people to be treated the same. So don't, don't come in here changing us. And, but and, we want your help. But yes. we want your help. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, it was truly, I, I hung up the phone on that call and just kind of giggled for a few minutes, but I could also tell that he was really wanting to do a lot of things and he, he, he had a passion for success. Uh, he was just, he was afraid of, of damaging a, a, an old, very mature, good insurance agency. And yeah. um, so he wanted to protect the, the legacy of the name and the brand, but um, he wanted something different. He just didn't know it. And then to watch what you guys have done over the last seven years has been amazing. Yeah. So you've done a great job. And I love the fact that I'm back here today and you continue to somewhat listen to my advice. Well, yeah. The, no the good news is, is I get a guest host today since Elliot's gone, so I can actually defend myself here. Yeah. yeah. There, I can't defend that. It, it's accurate. Yeah. It's accurate. It's accurate. But I will say, fortunately, we have managed to uh, institute quite a bit of change. You've, you've, uh, you've done a right tremendous here. amount of change, and, and, it's, and it's been Just hard to do. successful. Yeah. In an mm -hmm. archaic industry, 115-year-old er, agency, and... So I guess we're kind of looking forward to diving into that. Larry, I guess with that being said, kind of walk us through briefly your background and how you got to what you're doing today. Well, my background is pretty insane. So I'm going to narrow it down just specifically to what brought me to the insurance industry. And um, I, well, I'll give you one old story. And that was back when I had my very feeble short career in the NFL. Uh, Steve Garvey had a program back then that uh, would would test uh, football players and baseball and basketball, any professional athlete. They would test them to find out what what their skills are, and they would try to marry them up with their their uh, capacity of capabilities, what they would, could do for a career with companies in the off season. And um, I went through the testing, and they came out as financial services. That I, financial services and sales was my expertise that was really where where I would be successful they married me up with with Merrill Lynch and I was an off-season Merrill Lynch broker okay. uh, starting in finance so I always knew sales finance of some level would be interesting to me so then long story go to a lot of different places do different things corporate environment but then I went to work at a uh, heavy construction equipment company and the, the heavy construction equipment company uh, was a, uh, a pretty large for an independent type, and it was, had a lot of different types of brands. And, uh, and, and we had about 60 employees, two different shops, a lot of risk, a lot of risk mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. And I got involved in the insurance side of the business and, and watched how the different insurance agents worked with us. And there was some frustration in that, and there were some really positive things, some things I learned that was, that was very helpful to me. But what ended up happening was I left that company and I started my own consulting business in a lot of different areas that, that some other day we could talk about. But one of my biggest clients was an insurance agency. And that insurance agency brought me in. I got heavily involved in performance management, sales strategy coaching, all these things. It just became a good marriage. And they said, why don't you come on full time here and uh, be a consultant inside of our business with our clients. Okay. So that allowed me to start looking at consulting and they actually defined something for me that was helpful. 
And they said, we're going to define risk in a broader manner than most people. Um, Larry, you do a lot of management consulting. You do a lot of, of uh, uh, executive development stuff. You do a lot of team building things. You do a lot of financial stuff. And it seems like those are risks in a business. Those are things that if risk is defined as the potential of gain or loss, those are risks and you can help our clients with those risk issues. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an expansion of risk thinking. So I decided, yes, I'm going to come on board and we're going to do it. And it took me, I wanted to get licensed with the insurance products because I wanted to be knowledgeable about what I was around, but immediately fell in love with the industry. And the love came because of the frustration. Quickly, I started realizing I didn't know what to expect as a company. I didn't know what to expect from an insurance agent. I didn't know what was possible. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like when Henry Ford says that, um, you know, if I'd asked my clients what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Yeah. Um, I think that's where I was. People would say, what would you want insurance? And I would probably have said, great service, mm -hmm. low price, promise me that I'm going to get paid when I have a claim, be there when I need you. Yeah. Boy, that's what I want. Yeah. I had no idea what was possible. And when I got to the agency and started seeing what is behind the scenes and what you can do and what you should be doing and how you can be proactive and prevention and all these things changed my view. And I, I got passionate about it, fell in love with it, started selling products, started helping clients with risk issues. And um, that evolution then turned to me going back into the consulting business because I was very fortunate that I was able to move fast in success enough where people wanted my advice. And so now I've spent the last uh, 16 years advising insurance agencies on how to wow. uh, be a different thinker, look at the world different, think differently, act differently, grow faster, bring more value to your clients. Um, so that's kind of the story that brought me to the place of being the CEO of Insight Performance Group. <laughs> that's so, awesome. So I imagine <clears throat> The, the, when you shifted from being in the agency side to the consulting side, and then where we are today are probably even two very different positions from when you first went uh, from into the consulting side and then where you're consulting today. But maybe talk us or walk, walk us through or walk the listeners through when you first shifted into consulting, what was, what was kind of that mission or vision or purpose that you were driving that you saw being in the agency side and thought there's a better way to do this? I don't know that it's an easy first thought. Um, quite honestly, the reason I got excited about going that direction is because of complexity of thought. Mm. I saw, and I, and I have, a, I have a, another piece of my background that was pretty intense training in the business acumen side. I was at Ryder Commercial Leasing and Services, and I went through a almost uh, semi-doctorate level finance training. I went through some HR, legal Ryder was trying to develop me into a future senior executive in the company, and I got some of the most amazing training. But, but when I saw risk in a different light, saw how it could play out, my goal was to do multiple things. I wanted to help insurance agencies grow, stay independent. I wanted to um, help them see that it's not about teaching sales to get there. It's about changing organizations. It's better business planning, better leadership. Uh, better operations, lean systems and processes. Um, it's changing the way they think and changing the way clients think. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was an, I saw it as an opportunity with a very old industry mm -hmm. that could be successful in spite of itself. Mm -hmm. You can make money and not be good in this business. Yeah. <laughs> it's unfortunately and, very true. Right. And because of that, I saw opportunity of where companies could do amazing things, be mm -hmm a 900 pound gorilla in their marketplace if they just would think differently. Mm -hmm. And so that was my passion. My passion was I want to help the industry think differently, act differently. And ultimately, uh, kind of an, uh, I didn't have the term back then, but I, I now have defined it as that abundance thinking that if you do this right, if you can identify risk effectively, if you can um, help go through the whole risk identification Understand the complexity of risk, how broad that goes. To my point, you know, one of the things that I, I, I've emphasized my whole career is, you know, what's the risk of one of, of your management team not getting along and being effective and driving the company to success compared to the risk of your building burning down? Mm -hmm. Which do you think has more pop probability of happening? Yeah. So that's what I'm saying is really expanding that risk definition. Well, mm -hmm. all of that combined together brought me to a place 
of saying, if I can go out, help insurance agencies and brokers out there completely look at the world different, think differently, um, they will dominate in the marketplace. And abundance happens because the client is better. The carrier, insurance carrier is better. Yeah. The agent's better. The agency's better. Their families are better. Their communities are better. I talk to my team constantly about how we touch millions of lives every day from the insurance agent to the agency to the hundreds or thousands of clients to their thousands of employees. And if I teach you to do something that helps you help a client be safer and somebody's dad goes home at night and sees his kids and he's healthy, that's huge. That's the influence we have in this business. And that's the influence that I believe I have in this world today is I think there's literally millions of people that never will know my name, but they got impacted by what I teach. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a fantastic mindset. And uh, yeah, great philosophy. So I guess looking back, you mentioned you started Insight Group about 16 years ago. You know, I, I know that the agencies and firms that you're working with have obviously progressed through their way of thinking and um, changing the way that they think about risk management, et cetera. Where do you think the industry is, though, from a, as a whole? Do you think it's, you know, looking back when you first started Insight, are people still, are businesses and people still engaging and buying products like they used to? Or has there been a shift in the industry as, as you see it today? Yeah, first for clarity, I actually started Insight in 2014, joined up with another consulting firm back in 2005. 2014 bought that company and expanded it to more of what we do today. Um, the, the product before was a little more narrow and we've expanded it uh, quite a bit in 2014. Um, so, so what's changed? I would tell you that first of all, uh, everything that was happening back when I first got there is still happening in insurance agents today. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and for a lot of different reasons. I mean, some people are, are lazy in the way they buy insurance and they don't want to hear anything different. They're going to let people just quote their insurance and shift it every year and hope that they get the best price over time. Um, so there's every type of solution out there, but, but probably the best way I could explain it is um, I started studying early in my career, even when I was in the insurance business, I was studying where the insurance industry is. And one of the things that I identified was we were, we were trailing the financial services, uh, uh, financial advisory world mm -hmm. about 20 years. And because of that, it gave us a path to observe, mm -hmm. you know, and could we move faster into it and differentiate ourselves? And, and real quickly, and, and especially sitting here today in Omaha, uh, a lot of that is, was, uh, uh, it comes from the investment world that Omaha is so well known for. But if you look at, um, at, at what happened is there became a shift in the 1970s, 1980s, where um, the ability to buy financial services changed. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember in the 1970s, I was interested in financial services and I thought, be a stockbroker because that's the only place you invested. You had to find a stockbroker, give them your money. They would look at you and say, I have the licenses. I'm the smartest guy in the room. You just shut up and let me manage your money and I'll make you money. Mm -hmm. And that was how you invested. That was the only mechanism that you, you traded had. stocks for you. That was it. That was your only strategy. You couldn't, you couldn't do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, then all of a sudden, um, there comes along this company and Charles Schwab says, I got a better idea. How about we let you do it? We'll give you the research. We'll give you the background. We'll do the trade. We're going to let you start making your own decisions. Mm -hmm. And that shifted. And then what happened was there became a shift in the financial services world where you had transactional business and you had value. Mm -hmm. Value became people that did something different. They weren't stockbrokers. They were investment advisors, mm -hmm. they were investment consultants. They were financial advisors. All these different terms started coming up. And many of those people actually eliminated their, their licensing. Uh, they said, look, I don't want to be regulated by FINRA. I don't want to be one of those. I want to be smart mm -hmm. and guide you. And guess what happened? Those are the guys that start making the most money. Mm -hmm. So advice was worth more money 
transaction became worth less. Yep. Well, we've been watching the insurance industry go through that same evolution. And it's, yep. and it's accelerated through the pandemic. It's accelerated with technology. It's going to continue to accelerate. And the greatest value is going to be from people that have the knowledge to give advice and guidance. And it's going to be broader. I mean, I remember back in 2007, I was coaching a gentleman that's now one of the top financial advisors in the world. This guy was relatively new in the business. And we were talking through different strategies of, of how to be effective in, in what you do. And um, was, was guiding him towards, let's think broader than just my investments. And he came up with about 38 different things that, in, that are involved in wealth. Mm -hmm. 38 different areas that had something to do with my wealth. From tax to preparation to my own personal health. <laughs> what good is having all the wealth if I don't have any a good health? Mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to budget management. And it was 36, 38 different items. Well, that allowed him to then go to a buyer or to a person and say, you know what your wealth is? It's these 38 things. How are you doing in managing all of that? Mm -hmm. And everybody looked at it and said, I don't know. That's exactly right. I'll help you. I'll help you figure out how those things all fit together. I'll monitor them for you. And I'm going to give you guidance. Now, I may have other experts, a tax expert, a legal expert. I may have them involved, but we're sure. going to guide you. It's the same thing that we're in today in the, in the insurance industry and risk management industry. As advisors, the greatest financial reward for us and the greatest value to the client is to take all the complexity that exists and help the client navigate that. Let yeah. me tell you where you're at. Let me tell you where the potential of spending money you don't want to spend looks like today. And by the way, it's a lot more than 36 in the financial services world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a much bigger number. But if I can give you clarity and guide you through that, I now will get the most money. Yeah. And I'll bring the greatest value to the client. And someone else can do the transaction. Mm -hmm. That's what's shifting at this point in time. It's an exciting conversation. It, you know, I mean, there's so many ways, places you can go with this. <laughs> All right, so I, wanna, I actually want to piggyback a little bit on a question you asked because at Insight Performance Group, I, I know that, you know, many, uh, all of the partners in there are at least thinking this way and are at different levels of becoming, you know, the broader advisor. Yeah. But like industry-wide, what you see, one to 10, where is the industry actually being what you just described versus the product sale it was? Are we anywhere near even the halfway? Wow. Uh, it's, not been a, it's not been a prior, priority for me to try to monitor where it is, partly because I think the, uh, the end keeps changing. Yeah. You know, if I, if I said from day one, where are we? We're probably not quite to halfway. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's transactional stuff. I mean, you can see it. I mean, you can buy things online now. You don't need a, you don't need a broker anymore. So mm -hmm. certainly a lot of that transactional business has advanced over time. Uh, and, and you know what? There's certain people out there that are absolutely getting it in this mm -hmm. space, and they're doing insane amount of things. I mean, I, I coach 13 uh, uh, advisors out there that believe they can write a uh, million dollars worth of commission income in a single year. That's unheard of in the past, except for you know some exceptions, a few people out there. But this group is doing the is able to do these things because they they're doing it through advice. So I'm seeing really some pockets of that happening mm -hmm. but oh my gosh there's still people out there that are driving quotes and clients are driving quotes so it, it's a slow process um there's a lot of factors in the world of insurance and financial services carriers insurance carriers companies and agents that keep allowing them to be lazy and not have to make the move mm -hmm. exactly it's gonna it's pandemic forced some movement it forced some change yeah uh, we'll see some other things that will, and I, I think it's not going to be this steady growth towards. I think it's going to be this, and this. Different events, different activities will change, and a lot of it changes by market because somebody gets it, mm -hmm. and when somebody gets it, the competition either has to start figuring it out or they're going out of business. That's where we're seeing most of the changes, but no, it's not prevalent. It's yeah. not dominant, which is so opportunistic because if you get it. Goodbye, everybody else. Yeah. Well, know. that's a, that's kind of the framework or the reason behind the question is we're going to have a lot of people that watch this that are going to be absolutely still probably on one end of the spectrum. Some that are going to be all the way on the other. But my my guess is, is if we had the industry, the entire industry watching it or listening, a lion's share are going to be closer to kind of the original model. 
Yeah. yeah. And another part of the problem there, Andy, is that a lot of people will listen to this type of message and go, yeah, 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 I get it. I get it. Right. They're not willing to invest and go deep and go, what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? What do I have to do different? Well, there's significant costs, risks, everything that comes along with trying to make a change like that. I mean, what, what you Dis were talking about. Discomfort. 100%. <laughs> uh, yeah, you have to get Fair. out of your comfort zone. Oh, man. I, I mean, remember when I first got to the agency, and they were wonderful, and we went through great transformation. But the CEO asked me, uh, Larry, can you change us? Can you make us better? Because the first year I was there, I sold a lot of insurance or was involved in the leadership of selling a lot of insurance. And so the CEO looked at me and said, Larry, can you help us, you know, build it and they will come. Mm -hmm. We want more stuff. We want more resources. We want value add. We want to be advisors. We want to be consultants. Can you help us? I said, absolutely. I can do it. So I build it. And all of the producers were going, yeah, yeah, we want this, we want this, we want this. And I built it, and nobody did anything different. Mm -hmm. They didn't, he built it, they didn't come. They didn't come. No. They, they didn't want to do anything different. They're going, oh, no, I want you to build stuff so everybody else did things. I just want to keep doing what I want to do. So the, the, the desire and willingness to get uncomfortable and individuals change, that will hold this industry back for a long time. And the concern that we should all have is, uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Pablos Holman. He's a futurist. And he made the argument that to me one day, he said, Larry, um, innovators, disruptors do not want to change old industries. They build something right beside it yeah. and take you out. Yeah. People want to take us out. They haven't figured it out yet. I don't know that they can. The model that's in place today will be taken out. I just don't know how long or whether people internally will evolve to it or what. But it's too hard to change because people don't have to change because they make too much money. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, there's so much there. When you were talking about the parallels with what we do and the financial services industry, I mean, I, I was sitting in that seat at TD Ameritrade doing what Schwab was trying to do. I mean, we were recruiting and bringing in significant, amount of, uh, significant amounts of money to help uh, individuals manage on their own. Right. And then the robo advisor came in, right? Where it's like, okay, you know, it, handling your own money might not be for you because people learn things the hard way, but we have this easy solution. You don't have to talk to anybody, super cheap, and it's exactly what you need. And people are pulling back from that now in the financial services industry. It's the equivalent of like Berkshire Hathaway three. You know, we see that as risks in the risk management industry, but you can't replace the value of an advisor the way that you're referencing the value of an advisor. That's right. And, and but, but even in that model, TD Ameritrade, um, uh, Schwab, numerous ones realized that they went out of the trade business and they went into the education business. Yeah. Our job is to educate people so that they can make good decisions. And to your point, that's run its course and people are going new directions. And now you've got the complexity. The interesting thing about the insurance industry to the financial services industry is it was trailing like this, and now it's gone like that. Mm -hmm. Because what's happened is the financial industry is no longer operating off of fundamentals. It's all, it's, it's being driven by, by uh, uh, Twitter, <laughs> by market influence, things that are not fundamentally sound. Yeah, it's Crazy. Whereas the insurance industry will say fundamentally sound. It's going to be risk-based because it's going to get better at it because they have more data to allow for better underwriting, better, better management of risk and identification of risk. The insurance industry is going to go to more logical justification on the transaction, whereas the financial and services industry has completely lost its way on yeah. fundamentals. It, can, it cannot operate on fundamentals when the president of the United States can tweet and completely change the marketplace overnight. Or Elon Musk. Exactly. So, yeah. I mean, one of the, <laughs> so going back to something that you hit on, because I think it's important and I feel like it would be worthwhile for you and your background to maybe provide some tips to people who are sitting in, you know, this more of a transactional model and they have the want to, but they don't know how and they are starting to understand that there might be a better way because mm -hmm. I've chatted about, the, chatted about this before, but 
you know, I was at, I was lucky enough to be at TD Ameritrade when they were going from a transactional based model to an advisory based model. And we got to see the training come in. We got to see the tools, the goal planning softwares be developed and implemented and da 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 da. And I got to watch people's numbers go up and down based upon how early they adopted and how they, you know. So it's like I would live through that transition. And so it's not easy. It's not easy to do. I had to personally make the sacrifice to say, you know what? Like, they told me the sales cycle on helping a client is going to go from what could have been a day or an hour to 12, 24 months, right? Because um, you're going after larger, more complex deals, they need more resources, like all the different things that you were referencing as being, you know, part of the advisory experience. So going just on the heels of it's not easy to make this shift. Mm -hmm. What would you, you know, put yourself in an advisor's position, 35 years old in the industry, he's got some experience, he's got a long career ahead of him, realizes that quoting and price isn't the answer what what the heck do they do i'm gonna give you two things that i think they should do um the first thing is almost comical because we're talking about the future the first thing i would do is go back to the origin go back to the beginning of insurance because if you go to the beginning of insurance and understand it it will bring you to a place of understanding that got lost in in the in the uh the money making that happened between the beginning and today. In the very beginning, there was a group of spice trade uh, owners of businesses t- trying to sell sell uh, uh, their spices around the world, um, and they had ships that were going across the sea. What were the problems? Pirates, illness. You'd have a whole ship that'd get wiped out. Maybe a little uh, weather. Weather, and ships wouldn't come home. Mm-hmm. And an individual company would go out of business if their ships got you know, demolished or damaged. And so what happened was this group of London-based businesses sat around and said, I got an idea. Why don't we get a bunch of us together and let's pool our money. And that way, if a ship goes down, we'll help buy that one back for that one person. Each one of us has a little bit invested in that. And we can even get investors that want to play in this. And if there's any money left over, they can make money and maybe build a reinsurance risk. And that's what they did. They built that. Now, here's the part that most people don't know the rest of the story. The rest of the story was your ship has to be this age. You have to have somebody on board that has military experience. You have to have so many guns and so many weapons to protect yourself from the pirates. You have to have certain inspections done to make sure your ship can weather storms. Risk management. Mm -hmm. All of the things had to be right to put yourself in the pool. If you truly understand the origin and now you think about the risks that exist today and realize that I need to think about all the things that could influence what happens, Mm -hmm. um, it will change the way you think about insurance. That the best thing I can do for you as a insured is not just go schlep and find a price. The best thing I can do is really understand your risk. That's the first thing I would do is go to the beginning and get back to really understanding risk from a broader perspective. So I could truly advise a client on prevention, mitigation, transfer, finance, um, making sure that the right things are going to happen. The second thing that I would do, and this may be the most important thing, and that's to be very purposeful and specific in three areas of development. I have to become an expert that's constantly learning more about insurance, insurance products, how they're structured, because they change constantly. Uh, Language is changing. Carriers are changing. You need to understand the promise you're making to a client and make sure that those contracts are going to meet the need of the contra- of the client whenever that peril occurs. Second of all, you need to be- develop your business acumen because if we're going to this advisory space, mm-hmm. you better understand how business work. Business acumen means good business judgment. Mm-hmm. I can't have good business judgment, decision making, unless I know all the components, how they relate, interrelate, and how they will engage towards these risk issues. I need to understand finance, operations, um, economic issues, political issues. I need to understand as much as I can. So business acumen, read, 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 study specific areas. And then the third thing 
I used to call it sales skills, but I will tell you today, I, I've, I've changed that to behavioral science. You need to understand why people decide the way they decide. Why do they do what they do? Human beings are predictable, but they are irrational. Mm -hmm. So irrational, being irrational allows us to influence them. Predictability allows us to guide them effectively. We know how to get them to a certain place. Sales skills are learning techniques of how to sell. Behavioral science is understanding why you will do what you will do. I guarantee I can influence you if I understand those things effectively. Mm -hmm. So business acumen, behavioral science, technical knowledge, study those purposely every year, get better. Go back to the origins, look at insurance, and see how it applies today in a more, more complex world. If you take that path as a 35-year-old producer, Sky's the limit. you will dominate. Yeah. You will dominate. It's pretty awesome. I mean, at the end of the day, that is not as easy as slinging a product, right? It's a lot. It's a, Well, I think it's harder to go get quotes and sell insurance. I think it's harder. Yeah. I think it's a lot easier. It's hard to learn what it takes, but it's a lot easier to sit in front of somebody and say, I really care about your business. I'm going to learn everything I can. And I'm going to be in a long-term relationship in solving every risk issue I can for you um, because it's going, to make your, it's going to make sure that your employees go home healthy. It's going to make sure that they go home <laughs> at night. It's going to make sure that they feel good about themselves. They're better parents. Um, man, I find that to be really easy. So as an advisor, on the question he asked, you put in that work, winning business becomes a lot easier when, you're, when you've got that skill set. Uh, a lot easier. The right business. The right business. The right you know, business. That's the it's a lot easier. I mean, people are going to leave you for how you get brought on. Yeah. And, you know, we, we chat about that a that's lot. Right. And, yeah. and so it's way more difficult. We, the most trusted advisor that's been studied for decades is the, is the CPA. They get a seat at the table for every decision made yes. uh, with a business owner. But the risk management guy doesn't have a seat at the room. And I think that's kind of what, like, we deserve a seat and we need to, I mean, I, I should say that differently. We need to earn a spot at that seat because what we do is so important. That's right. That's right. That hard question. I think it's hard to constantly go out and get the volume of people that will give me the ability to quote and then go put my whole staff to work and put together insurance quotes and, and all of the follow-up activity and then go propose it and lose 80, 90% of the time, that's hard. Just heard the stat, 92%. That 92% they lose. stay with their current relationship. Yeah, that, that's hard, in my opinion. I think that would be a hard living to make. Yep. Mm -hmm. I find it easy to go out and be an advisor, convince people to think differently and convince them that the way I will do it for them is better and pick up broker of record. What's hard is becoming that person. Yeah. Now, once you become it, it's so much easier. It's the easiest. I think it's way too easy. It's hard becoming that. That's the effort that takes. Mm -hmm. Get uncomfortable, do things you're not, you're not comfortable doing, learn things, put in time investment. The number of insurance brokers and agents out there that have told me, Larry, I don't like to read. Larry, I don't want to put a couple hours a day into reading. Larry, I don't really want to. They're right. They're right. Yeah. And boy, that is so sexy. Because that means all the rest of us are going to kick the crap out of them. Yeah, it's a major opportunity. So when you hear that, you know, it's, it's like when I played football and in high school. And a lot of my buddies are like, oh, man, I don't want to go work out. I don't want and you hear eight or nine out of ten that say, I don't want to. Hmm. No. So if I do, what does that do for me? Mm -hmm. Puts me ahead. That's the game. And right now the game is people don't want to because they don't have to. But what if you do? What if All right. Do? So That's I'm going to awesome. throw a couple questions at you and then well, let's wrap up. What's my favorite color? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I already know that one. Larry. <laughs> uh, is it going to take an event to change the way, to dramatically change the way that risk management is delivered today? Um, I, I, I'm not Nostradamus. I don't have a, a crystal ball. Uh, I think the answer is no. 
I don't believe it's going to be an event. Could there be an event that does? Yes. Do I believe that will happen? I think the answer is no. And the reason why is there's so much complexity in the world today and there's so many different businesses out there and there's so many different things that it can be done. What's going to happen is there will be some that will just elevate and become elite and, and they will dominate. Will some companies go out of business? I think they will. I think there'll be some people that suffer through this, but I don't believe in my lifetime anyway, we're going to see a transformative change to this industry where insurance agents are all of a sudden, you know, all this elite uh, consultant that we know is possible. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I'd like it to happen, but I don't think it will. Well, it's interesting. I mean, that's going back to the financial services stuff. I mean, 01, 02, 08, 09, that dramatically helped accelerate some of the changes in the financial services industry. And like you look back in the risk management history books and we don't have those types of events that have dramatically changed the yeah. delivery process. The Black Mondays, for those type of things. Then, no, you're, you're spot on. But but in, in this space, there will be little events. A pandemic did have an impact. Mm-hmm. I mean, I did see now the best of the best were still growing like crazy through the pandemic because they were out giving advice and guidance. And people got mad at the insurance. They were mad because they couldn't get coverage um, during the pandemic or, or things that were, they thought were covered were not. So we'll see little events. We've seen floods before that change the way people look at advice they give. Yeah. So there's little events, there's pockets of activities that'll happen, but the, there's so much information out there and there's so many buyers out there that are lazy buyers and there is, um, they're polarized so much in their beliefs. There's algorithms that are telling them so many different things and people are going to pick their cognitive biases and, you know, I'm, I'm going to run across a contractor that's going to, for his entire life, say, I have to bid work, you have to bid work. Mm-hmm. It's illogical. It's totally illogical. Two different types of businesses, two different types of things. But they're not going to get off that because that's a cognitive bias that they want to live by. I don't think everybody's going to change. Yeah. All right. Well. That was good. Yeah. I mean, there is a ton for pretty much every level of agent broker advisor in the industry take away from it so that was that was cool awesome well, it's fun we to play with you guys look yeah. forward to having you on again sometime if yeah. uh and you know helping change the way people think and have conversations that get past the premium so right. well the the my final and one of my favorite quotes is this St- uh, Stephen jobs said good companies will ask their clients and find out what they want and what they need and then they'll they'll deliver it but great companies will change the way their clients think. That's right. And you guys are changing the way people think with this podcast. I continue to hope that I can change the way people think. And um, that's what's going to be the change of the world is changing how you think, not necessarily all the stuff that you do. We have to show them that there's not a, like, the horse isn't the answer, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, there that you was go. great. All right. Thanks, Larry. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.